Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sergio Silva, and I work for Cisco's Cloud Security team. And today I'm going to speak about ransomware. Now, hopefully by the end of the session, you'll have a pretty good idea of how ransomware came into being, how to build over time, and what best practices you can follow to protect your organization from these attacks, obviously using the best in-class ransomware solution. Now, every day around the world, people receive a page either identical or very much similar to this. And this will pretty much ruin the entire day. And that's no surprise. It is currently the worst possible problem that any organization can, fail to do, can, can face today. And here are a few examples that I'd like to cover on the evolution of ransomware. Ransomware recently started its life as a type of malware that would compromise in machines looking for Bitcoin. The reason for this is that you can no longer mine Bitcoins because the mining has become so complex and really expensive. So the best possible way and the best possible way to get a maximum return is to resort to actually stealing them rather than mining them. So you could think of a similar scenario to the days of the West when the cowboys would go and rob a specific train on the move. However, this was not successful as a lot of people with actually serious amounts of bitcoins would actually not store them on an endpoint. So the attack has actually resorted to encrypting certain files or segments of the machine, sort of like phishing, so that they could throw out that bait, see what catches, and this is how it basically started. At first, customers were held at ransom for data that was encrypted as part of the hard drive, which then expanded to obviously this complete hard drive encryption, uh, and then now we started searching for those, you know, those shares and encrypting those shares too. This was a massive impact to the organization. When you think about this, critical data was being held at ransom. We used to say a lot of the small organizations that didn't follow best practice or people with technology actually failed them, ended up paying the safety ransom away, or eventually the organization actually never recovered and actually closed down. We even had cases where um, hotels were being held at ransom as a system that would, you know, obviously allow people into their hotel rooms was compromised and people were being locked out of their hotel rooms. But a more interesting one that I found was the one around the impact of the Internet of Things was back in December 2016 when we had smart televisions being held at ransom. Think of the impact to a lot of our businesses today that use smart televisions to do these presentations. Uh, the worst case is that trust element. Imagine a customer coming in to be presented on, and then all of a sudden this page comes up demanding a ransom. This would not go well at all with that customer. As you can imagine, that trust relationship would no, no longer be there or very much compromised. And finally, one of the favorite ones that I have, um, the popcorn ransomware, which was a, basically a variant of Lockheed, uh, where the actual ransomware would actually do what it does best, which was to encrypt your data, but effectively the way they demanded you to release that data was done differently. They gave you the option to pay those bitcoins or to nominate two people to receive that ransomware so that you get your key release to get your data back. Uh, and obviously this became very much a psychological war game as no one would actually nominate any of their friends or family. Uh, well, I guess that depends on how you feel about your family. but. <laughs> Out of all, but seriously, I mean, um, think about, you know, think about it this way. If you have no way out, you would never nominate the people closest to you. So you would always go after your worst enemy. So it's, it's very much a psychological game there. The problem that I've seen in the field, though, so is that a lot of people that end up paying the ransomware will ultimately be ransomware to gain. And why you ask? Well, it's pretty simple. They only decrypt the data that's important to them. And what happens is that the malware looks around the system and sees that it's meant to encrypt 60% of the data and only sees that 40% is encrypted. So what it will do is just go and encrypt randomly another 20%. Uh, and once again, it might hit that important data that's important to that person. And once again, they are held at ransom and then once again go through the process of paying that ransomware in order to decrypt, to, you know, get the key and decrypt the data. So my advice is, decrypt everything, whether it's important or not. It will obviously save you a lot, of, a lot of headaches. So those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. 
So let's touch a little bit on the history of ransomware. So ransomware is not a type of malware that's been around for just a couple of years. It's been around since 1989. But it was not as successful as it is today because, well, very simple, a couple of simple things, right? The maturity of the internet at the time was very, you know, immature at the time. Um, think about how the networks were connected uh, internally. But most importantly, think about how many interconnections were there back in 1989. And also think about how work was the destination. Work was where you got your email. Work was where you got your internet access. So, you know, remote access wasn't even a thought. So think about how the evolution of, um, of how, it, how ransomware has moved with the way we work today. Now, why is ransomware so important for attackers? Well, let's consider the Scholar attack of 2010, right? Now, it's really important for you to understand how the attack is actually run and why the attacker prefers this type of attack to a traditional malware. And that is out there. And the best way to, that I can think of demonstrates this is to compare ransomware to Stuxnet. Stuxnet was the most sophisticated malware attack ever run to date. Yes, it was geopolitical, and yes, you know, they had lawyers that would guide the actual target of the attack. But what I want to focus on is the amount of code required for this specific attack. Now, consider that Stuxnet was about 15,000 lines of beautifully well-coded, well, code, right? Um, so well written that it actually had four day zeros within the actual code itself. So that's a lot of complexity. It took large security vendors a number of days to actually dissect that code. Now consider ransomware. Less than a couple of thousand lines of code, an encryption module, and a Bitcoin setup to take that payment to a specific wallet. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. Simple and effective. Now, when you start to consider how the attack actually runs, um, this is how it basically runs traditionally, because we've obviously seen some variants happen over the last couple of months. But traditionally, the way a, a ransomware has usually got onto your system is either one or two mechanisms. The first mechanism is obviously someone goes and clicks on a malvertising link. That malvertising link then sends um, and downloads an exploit kit onto the actual machine itself. The exploit then starts to look around the machine and starts to look for the vulnerabilities. It starts to see what's open. It starts to disable things like the firewall, starts to, uh, to call out to the internet. And one of the primary reasons it's trying to call out to things like Yahoo, Google, and that is effectively it wants to see if it can get out to the internet, that it's not inside of a sandbox environment. And once it detects that, it then tries to call to the infrastructure that's been created uh, to run the attack. So what it'll do is it'll call back to those domains that actually host the payload. And if it can reach that, uh, that domain, it'll then download the payload and then encrypt your data. And then you then have to get the encryption key in order to, dis to decrypt your data. And it's fundamentally the very same way as it works with email. The only difference is the transport mechanism where obviously you, you're getting an email and inside that email you might have a link that's been allowed through and you click on that link and the whole process starts again. It starts to call out to the exploit site and then the, the pilot site, so on and so forth. And obviously at the end of the day you get ransomed once again. Now one of the key things I want to highlight in the slide is that um, when you start to look at one of the primary things that ransomware use, you can see that you know the DNS functionality is, is in every single variant over the last 18 months of the different types of malware. Obviously, we have seen a little bit of a difference with WannaCry, but effectively, uh, all the variants have used DNS to call back to that out to that command control infrastructure in order to either download the exploit or download that payload that effectively goes and encrypts your data. Well, one across was slightly different, but it still had DNS involved because within the actual code, it was the registration of that domain that caused the kill chain to come into effect and stop the attack. But effectively, it was using primarily a vulnerability in SMB version 1 in order to spread the attack itself with the worm involved. Now, it, so let's take into consideration this. So, in research done by Lancope, which is obviously now part of Cisco, 
they found that 15% of command and control backs bypasses web ports and ports covered by the traditional web security systems. So you're most likely to have a gap in that coverage if you're only relying on on your software gate, on your security gateways or your, your web security gateways or perimeter security. When Cisco conducted uh, additional research, they found that 91% of command and control banks actually relied on DNS. So by using Umbrella, you have the ability to block the vast majority of those command and control banks. So what about the other 9%? Umbrella can also block direct IP connections and even proxy data in order to block those specific URLs. And obviously, one of the key things that we've seen is obviously how the evolution of ransomware has caused such a huge problem from the aspect of how much money they've made, meaning that there's a lot of organizations out there that have admitted that they've been ransomed, but at the same time, there's also a lot of organizations that have not actually admitted to being ransomed. And obviously, this is going to change with the evolution of what GDPR brings into play, right? So when you think about GDPR and you think about the effect of GDPR in its, um, how it's going to obviously affect users to admit to being ransomed, that's obviously going to increase these numbers. But effectively, it's been the most, probably the most effective and most uh, uh, valuable resource to any attack that's been out there that ransomware has actually proven to do a billion dollar business just in one year, that 12 months. And this all was only just during 2016. Um, what they anticipate is by 2020 that you'll have, obviously, this business grow to about 10 billion. And that's a serious problem that we face uh, today. But one of the key things I just wanted to quickly touch on is the value of Bitcoin. When you consider that, you know, the value of Bitcoin and how much it's increased, look at the numbers here. You've got basically from September to this year's July, the value of Bitcoin has increased almost, you know, incredibly high. So the, 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 the problem of, you know, having been ransomed and then actually paying in Bitcoin has actually had an effect on increasing the value of Bitcoin over time. So it's been a really interesting drive for that as well. So one of the key things that we also notice is obviously, you know, the, the problem. Uh, the customers that can be taken hostage by malware, that locks up their critical resources and the effect of having that happen to businesses that in some cases businesses actually lock down and actually never recover from that. And a lot, and it's not been just defined to one specific area, it's been across all different silos from you know, your, your hospitals to your public sector to your financial uh, institutions to retail. No one's been uh, you know, avoided, if, if you could put it in that aspect. But one of the key things I just wanna highlight here is that when you think about the numbers, you know, in, in 2016, last year, on the first quarter of 2016, you were basically being hit by ransomware every 20 seconds. Recently, it's every 10 seconds a consumer actually gets hit by ransomware. And the same goes for, you know, um, organizations. You know, when you think about uh, quarter one of 2016, it was happening every two minutes. It's now up to 40 seconds that every a company gets hit by ransomware. And this is a very serious problem. So the way we work has obviously changed. 49% of the workforce is mobile, and in a recent survey, um, they state 82% of the respondents admitted that they're not even using VPN at any time. Uh, cloud adoption and SaaS uh, has obviously in, you know, increased, and it's expected to increase even more in the next two years. We can expect that to about 70% of usage, but 70% of the enterprise branch office um, report direct to the direct internet access. And that's one of the things that we saw with WannaCry being a big problem is that it wasn't the centralized sites that were being, you know, that were being affected. It was those direct to the internet access that were being compromised by obviously, um, you know, the uh, direct access link that being vulnerable to those machines who are facing outbound. So obviously these big problems have come into play and obviously the controls need to shift to the cloud. So the way we work has changed but security must change too with that. So, let's talk a little bit about Umbrella. So in today's um, cloud-connected world, the way we work has changed, security has not. So when half the PCs and organizations are mobile, you need to protect your workforce um, 
wherever they access the internet. So it's not just just when they're in the office. Consider that over 70% of malware that's been seen just this year has been unique to that organization. So you can't just detect malicious payloads. You need to identify attacks uh, as they are staged on the internet so that you can block them before they launch. So by doing this, let's look at the actual anatomy of the attack, okay? So you've got patient zero. This refers to the very first machine that's infected with a malicious code. There's obviously a misconception sometimes that the attacker life cycle starts with patient zero. So once patient zero is affected, the attacker does this, what they call a targeted expansion to the, to the similar segment, then a wide scale expansion to all. So then we that you've got these traditional security, uh, security vendors trying to catch up and reverse engineer the code and then create a signature that then they push out to the customers in the form of an update. Now, from the other side of the coin, you've got to look at the timeline in more detail, which means before the attack's actually launched, the attack has to spin up all these servers in the dark of the internet. The domain needs to be registered. Uh, IPs, ASNs have to be allocated. And although these threats continue to increase in sophistication, the attackers often still become lazy and still use the same infrastructure in multiple attacks because this infrastructure is expensive. So they then start to leave behind their, their, their cyber uh, fingerprints, right? So Umbrella uses data from our global network and our statistical models to uncover all of this information to stop the attacks before you know, that patient zero actually hits. So where do we actually fit into, this, into the picture? So one of the things you'll see that Umbrella blocks the request to that export domain. So whether you're clicking on that malvertising link or you're clicking on an email that's sending you off to a, a DNS request to go and resolve to a domain that holds that exploit, we will block that. Umbrella also blocks the DNS request which would lead to the malware download. So when you, if you are an infected device and you're trying to get back to the command and control infrastructure to download that payload, you know, we will stop that, we will block that there because it's a DNS response in order to get to that domain. So we would see some malicious domain and we will block it. And obviously Umbrella will block the request to that encryption um, key infrastructure. And we see this a lot. Uh, a lot of the times that we can see this data, we can actually put this into a graphical representation so we can actually see the actual infrastructure of the, of the actual attacker themselves. And you can see that the encryption module is obviously one of those uh, modules within that attack itself. So let's talk a little bit about our numbers. So we are um, a SAS service. We have got over 600 uh, um, BGP pairings using BGP Anycast, which fundamentally means by using BGP Anycast, you're a very scalable and flexible solution. We have crossed 25 data centers across the world, and we've got 100% uptime since 2006 due to the scalability and flexibility of uh, BGP Anycast in its, in its actual architecture itself. We see about 100 billion requests a day uh, with over 85 million daily active users that use our product, with more than 12,000 customers that actually use our product in the enterprise. And this is across 160 countries across the world. Uh, our, our efficacy is very much down to discovering 3 million new domains each and every day, right? Out of that, we identify 60,000 plus daily malicious destinations, and we can enforce 7 million blocks just based on DNS itself. One of the things we pride ourselves on is that we can also demonstrate how many requests we're seeing on a daily basis. So this is available on system.opendns.com where you can actually see the number of requests that are being made. I took a snapshot of yesterday's uh, um, average um, number of requests and you can see that we're sitting now at about 108 billion and a half requests per day. So with DNS resolution, we can make many threat discoveries. So first, any device will send its DNS request to Cisco Umbrella. We'll analyze those requests to detect many types of threats and anomalies. Uh, for example, we can determine if a system is compromised based on the types of requests they're making. So if the device is making a request to another known bad domain, it's more likely to be compromised. Um, so the user request patterns across our, our user base give us the great insight to potential uh, to potential um, threats, that is. In the second half of the process, 
If our global cache doesn't contain a non-expired uh, response to the request, then we'll request that you contact all the name servers that are authoritative for the domains requested. And the process then gathers all the authoritative logs from virtually every domain daily, which we then use to find these newly staged infrastructures and other types of anomalies. And this is all based on Umbrella being a recursive DNS, sort of like man in the middle. We see everything that's coming from an organization. We take into consideration all the view that we already have, the internet, we provide a great solution to protect your users. We combine this DNS uh, layer visibility with uh, things like the WHOIS records, your BGP routes, your Cisco AMP, and other data sets in real time. And we basically form this massive uh, graph database, and then we continuously run statistical models, machine learning essentially, against that. Um, and then more than one reputation score, we can analyze historical and live events um, to statistically score the guilt. So your guilt by association, your guilt by inference of the domains and IPs that are part of the attacker's infrastructure. We determine the guilt using these three approaches known as inference, association, or pattern, right? Uh, we've built a lot of statistical models already, but as part of the launch, we've also announced this live DGA prediction and sender rank plus the additional of the three security categories that you've seen there of the newly seen domains, potentially harmful domains, as well as uh, DNS tunneling. So, Umbrella obviously provides that first layer of, of detection. It is primarily used to protect your organization on whatever type of architecture that they have. So whether you are uh, you know, an uh, organization with a huge headquarters or whether you have, uh, you know, as part of your big organization, you have smaller branches or you have users that are randomly walking around, working from one office to another, working from an airport or, or just, you know, on the road. Um, you will provide that layer of protection wherever they are, wherever they go, whatever country they are across the globe. And this obviously starts off with DNS. We provide that first layer of defense using um, security to DNS layer which obviously precedes anything like file executions or IP connections, because bear this in mind. If you don't know where to send the packet, if you don't know the address of that destination, you're never going to resolve the next step, which is to open up a port 80 or a 443 and SSL connection to connect to that. So that's why we would precede any sort of infection that's being dropped onto your machine or connection by IP. And this is obviously used by all devices and it's port in protocol agnostic. Um, so we provide this uh, protection of visibility for all activity um, over wherever you are. So that will cover all your office locations, any devices that connect to your network, any roaming devices that are outside of your network across any port and protocol. We also give you this huge visibility across um, what you're able to get to see by using DNS. So we got this huge visibility of what your users are making requests to. So if your users are using all these different types of cloud services, if you have IoT devices that are connected to your network, um, we will see this. We'll also see social media, the requests to Facebook and, and things like that. But the important aspect of this is that we actually give you a good visibility of what's going on within your network, of what the type of cloud services your users are using, which is fundamentally a great place to be because you'd be very surprised how many organizations don't really understand how much of those cloud services, how much IoT is actually connected to their network. So we give you this great visibility across that. So let's talk a little bit about how Umbrella is architected. So Umbrella is built into the foundation of the internet, right? So what that means is that we either resolve or we block a request. So we will resolve requests that are going to legitimate websites that are benign, and we will block anything that is you know, malicious in intent. And this will cover pretty much up to 95% of all traffic that's going through your network. There is this 5% of traffic that you cannot tell completely that it's been, you know, it's malicious or it's actually completely benign. There might be behaviors that they are exuberating that might detail that they're acting in a certain way. So therefore, what we do then is we do what we call intelligent proxy. Um, that's pretty much like a selective proxy. We will um, obviously do that 5% of traffic. And within that, we start to look at things like, are they hosting any risky URL? Um, uh, links, are they hosting any malicious files? Um, and we can look further and deeper to the stack to completely tell whether that site is actually completely benign or actually it's malicious and we'll continue to block it. 
And then obviously on and off network, we have a roaming client that provides us protection, whether you're on the network or off the actual network itself. So, in summary, Cisco Umbrella will obviously prevent any connections before or during or after an attack, whether it's web-based or is, um, you know, malvertising. We will block those uh, those connections from being made through, so you don't get any exploits or phishing or any sort of attacks hitting the networks, or getting if you are infected to actually get back to that command control infrastructure to download those exploits or, or command control uh, malicious payloads. And we basically, by doing this, we can stop the exfiltration of data or the encryption of your data through ransomware techniques. So sometimes the best hiding place is the one that's in hiding in plain sight. And I want to show you a little bit of a couple of things while we say this. So we can see the attacks and we can see how they, the attack is staged their infrastructure. So to give you a real world example, we're just going to go through a really good example of how it actually has come together. So this is a bottle of Chateau Magua 1787. This is one of the finest bottles of wine that's ever been produced. But what makes this bottle even more interesting is that it happens to be the most expensive bottle of wine ever sold. It was sold for about 500,000, and as you can imagine, that if you're a business selling these very expensive bottles of wine, you basically hold an elite database of very wealthy consumers. So you can also imagine that, you know, what what would be really unsettling about this is that this would be the perfect setting for a targeted attack because essentially what is happening here is that the domain that had been hijacked was hosting this exploit target and by everyone going towards this it was very fundamentally a targeted attack so everyone was going ahead and buying this bottle of expensive wine and what will happen is once they bought that bottle of expensive wine they'll be very happy to have this bottle of wine but there'll be a bittersweet remembrance because within a couple of days the export kit would run, it would call out to the command and control infrastructure, download that payload, and before you know it, it would become a very bittersweet memory of what's actually been acquired. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the infection mechanism on this. So one of the things that you'll notice here is that there was email involved as well as um, obviously some advertising. So what it would do is actually, could, this email would be sent, it would have a link, this would send it off to a JavaScript downloader, and then obviously from there, the download would then encrypt, encode that ransomware payload in the form of a data file that then would be encoded and executed on the actual machine itself. Um, this is basically malware installed on WAN. Now, if the name is not a giveaway or an arrogant expression of how the attack is the attitude towards the victims, we notice that almost immediately the activity towards this domain goes from near nothing to, uh, to a large number of requests within a few minutes. We can see that the domain is registered to this Russian uh, email address that happens to own 80% of their domains that are malicious in intent, right? We can also observe that, this, uh, that when it was tagged, our system as a malware payload distribution, it was actually done two days before we, anyone else saw it. So you can see over here, they picked it up on, we picked it up on the 30th of uh, August 2016. And you can also see that when you start looking at things like, uh, you know, ransomware tracker, they saw it two days later. And I'll show you a little bit of an example a little bit later of how this actually came into being. But essentially, you can see how that there's a relationship between all the malicious um, uh, payload domains and also the actual domain that's selling the expensive alcohol because of the, the way it's performed, that co-occurrence states that the requests were made at a global scale within a specific time span, other than just before or after. Um, even in some occasions, you know, during the time they were making the request to this malwareinstall.com, 100% of the time the requests were also being made to this favorite alcohol site, um, as you can see, qualitate.co.gp. So, what is a co-occurrence? So a co-occurrence is very much like I've just mentioned. It's basically the number of requests that are being made at any point in time uh, within a specific time target. So if you're looking at, let's say, the last hour, uh, the number of requests that are being made to Cisco.com, that 
at the same time that people are making requests for this, it's got to come just before or after or even during, a number of requests will be made to other domains. Now, it's not to say that all domains are going to be malicious, but we can pick and choose which ones are the ones that are actually resembling the exact same pattern. So you can see here in tnd.com, you can see that they are possible parts of the actual attack that's going on at this point in time. And you can associate to the pattern and build it up that those are all part of the same attack infrastructure. Now, this is what the actual site looks like that was compromised. Obviously, it looks like a very innocent site. It is a, a, a real site, so please don't go in and try and Google this site. This is a, a very real site that was actually compromised. But as you can see, it is a legitimate site that obviously was compromised by this malicious uh, targeted attack. So let's take into perspective of what, um, what this actually resembles here. So this is uh, Open Graffiti. Open Graffiti is one of our open source uh, products that has been developed by one of our PhDs. Um, they did this as part of their thesis when they wanted to actually take the data that they could pick up on and actually give it a graphical user representation of what the actual attack looks like. Um, so the domains in red are the domains that are blocked by umbrella and they represent the infrastructure that is owned by the attacker. So obviously red, red is bad. Um, we see the relationships again then with um, between malware install and the qualitative domains here. So you can see here, that's the site we just saw on uh, Investigate. This is the site that's obviously been compromised a bit. That was that uh, beautiful wine shop that we just saw the, the, the front page to. Uh, there is a co-occurrence between these. So the number of requests being made here, 100% of the time the requests are being made here. So in actual fact, when you turn it on its head, it's, it's very fundamentally this. I'm making a request and I'm buying a bottle of wine. And 100% of the time that I'm making a request there, it gets redirected to this malware install at Wayne. And then you can see here that Qualitate is actually hosting the exploit kit here, which is this hash that is obviously highlighted in yellow. Once that exploit kit runs, it then starts to call out to a number of domains to see whether it's out in the open in the internet, so it's not done in the sandbox. And that's where you see that request going to malware install at Wayne. Now, the infrastructure that we see here that's highlighted now in yellow, these are the, these are, this is the infrastructure that's owned by the same attacker. So he just doesn't have just one domain in his pocket, he has a number of domains. So what that effectively means is that any attack that's happening now, he could pretty much put that domain to rest and use any of these other four domains in future as part of the attack. You can also see that the actual name servers the domains are actually using all the same name server infrastructure, as well as the same IP infrastructure that hosts a number of different uh, payloads that you can see there in yellow. Um, and then you also you can also see the same IP infrastructure up here that is corresponding to the same domains that he hosts. And all of this is part of the same attack. So in summary, current malware distribution point, there's the infrastructure that he can use in future so we can actually predict that the domain that you use in the future to actually block them because we know that they'll come into play at one stage or another. And then obviously the email addresses that are associated to that, the name server infrastructure, and also we can expose all the IPs and predict the next moves for this attack if it ever moves to the next uh, uh, variant. So here's a, like I said before, um, we've got here a snapshot of virus total. Virus Total actually picked up this attack on the 31st of August. We had already picked it up 24 hours before the attack. So taking two considerations, um, we've got obviously Malva, the, the ransomware tracker that picked it up two days later. We've got Virus Total that picked it up a day later. We were ahead of the curve by picking it up 24 hours even before Virus Total. So let's go through what sets us apart from anyone else. So um, we are the fastest and most reliable cloud infrastructure. When customers connect to the cloud security platform, performance is critical. It cannot break or slow down the internet connection. So since our network was established in 2006, we've had 100% uptime. And it's not just that, we also have peering relationships with over 600 ISPs, uh, which allow us to resolve requests a lot faster. So most customers actually report a boost in the actual speed. We are the most open platform, we leverage uh, bi-directional APIs. Customers can easily integrate Umbrella with existing tools to automatically add 
to the platform and enhance their system, extending the protection or enhancing their performance. We're the easiest deployment, and this is no joke. We are the easiest deployment ever. There's no hardware uh, to install or software to update um, manually. Customers can just leverage their existing Cisco footprint to provision thousands of devices and laptops just within a few minutes. Um, and also our coverage. We have the broadest coverage of malicious destination and files. Not only do we have the power of the malicious domains and IPs that we had in Umbrella before, but we also can leverage coverage for malicious files that are attempted to be downloaded from this new domain, and this is also through the power of AMP. So, the only thing worse than being blind is having the sight but no vision. Now, I want to complete the story of the wine. So, um, the bottle of wine did not actually have a good ending. As that, you know, the person that actually bought the bottle of wine he used to be invited to a lot of different uh, events to show off the most expensive bottle of wine ever. Um, and at one dinner, uh, whilst he sat down for dinner, one of the waiters actually knocked the bottle off the table and uh, it obviously smashed to a thousand pieces. But I guess the lucky point here is that the actual owner had the foresight to have this bottle insured, and by doing so, he managed to get at least half the money back. Uh, but not everyone has this foresight in order to cover themselves when risk of things going wrong is pretty high. So let's consider the following numbers and why are these numbers so significant. Well, over a short period of time, usually between uh, 14 to 30 days, we, while you're doing any sort of proof of value with us, you can see uh, a high number of threats that are going across all these different POVs that are running. Even though the majority of these organizations are running a mixture of, you know, in you know, firewalls, antivirus, and other security tools, with the umbrella pub, we actually provide insight into threats and attacks that you're currently actually missing, right? Um, so what I would say is, please consider running a proof of concept with us and see what value we can bring to you and your organization. I want to thank everyone today here for your time. Um, to listen to my presentation, and I hope that it was successful uh, and, and a, good, uh, a good opportunity for you to understand the product. Thank you.